The Vape Passion Show, episode 23. Hey everybody, welcome back to the show. So it's the day before 4th of July, and... My neighborhood just has fireworks going off everywhere. Uh, Fireworks are actually, all fireworks are banned in my city. Uh, You can buy them in my city, but you're not allowed to light them. I don't know why. Uh, Colorado had a drought like five years ago, and so they they banned fireworks during that drought, but then they never undid the ban. So I don't know what's going on with that, but anyway, people don't care about it. People are bringing in illegal fireworks from Wyoming and lighting them anyway. So uh, you might hear some background noise during the show. I really don't mind though. It's really cool seeing all of these fireworks going up behind my house from my office where I'm recording this. Yesterday I went to the Renaissance Festival in Larkspur, Colorado, which is about an hour and a half away from where I live, kind of up in the mountains a little bit. It was a lot of fun. I've never been to the Renaissance Festival before. It was it was crazy. I always hear people talking about it. I think it's one of the biggest Uh, renaissance festivals in the united states it's like a little city a whole town and it's built specifically for the renaissance festival it runs for three months out of the year june july and august only on the weekends and then it just shuts down the whole town is is then empty for the rest of the year They, they don't do anything with it so that's really crazy but yeah it was a lot of fun as for my vaping life uh no new products but i did just place a order for a bunch of flavor concentrates from Wizard Labs and what's the other one? Isig Express. And I think I ordered like 10 different flavors and I'm going to make three different e-liquids out of that. Uh, I mentioned in a show previously uh, an e-juice titled Mega Man Yogurt, which is supposed to be similar to Rocket Man from One Hit Wonder, but with some slight variations. So I ordered the ingredients for that one. And the other two are from a pretty well-known DIY e-liquid juice maker over on Reddit named C. Winthrop. He's retired from e-juice, from what I can tell, but he has some a lot of really good recipes over there. So one of the recipes of his that I'm going to make is barbecue sauce. Obviously that one is not going to be a an all-day vape, but it's going to be fun, and I'm really excited to try that one. And the other one of his, this was the last one that he ever published. It's called Practically Perfect, and it's an amaretto, almond, peach, and orange flavored e-juice. And he says that everyone he knows loves it. It's an all-day vape. So I haven't gotten those concentrates in the mail yet. I'll probably get them before you see the show or, or listen to the show, but I don't have time to include it in the show. All the flavors that I got there cost me about 30 bucks, which is a pretty good deal, I think. You can get two premium bottles of e-juice for that cost, And out of all the flavorings that I'm going to get here, I can make three bottles, three different flavors of e-juice 10 times, 20 times over. So it saves a lot of money doing DIY, and it's fun. And on that note of DIY, I've been really getting into it a lot lately. I noticed that the DIY e-juice subreddit has a monthly recipe thread, and this is a place where people can submit their latest creations. The July thread already has a ton of great sounding recipes in it, and I'm just going to run through a few of them real quick. So there's one called Area 51, has caramel, creamy yogurt, grapefruit, marshmallow, and raspberry. That sounds really interesting. There's a juicy watermelon with light sweet apple, peach melon lemonade, key lime bar with coconut almond graham crust and whipped cream cheese frosting, chocolate milk, key lime coconut pie, frozen apple baco, grape ice cream cone, melon burst, cinnamon roll, creme brulee, Blueberry cereal, and another very unique one titled Bitter. This one has common flavors like dragon fruit, Fuji, mango, pineapple, lemon, and then it has cactus, culotta, and the unique flavor here is bilberry. And I don't know what blue bilberry is, but the creator of this e juice, he says that it smells like goat's butthole, and you know, that doesn't sound appetizing at all. Sounds pretty disgusting, but he says he's tried something like a hundred different variations before getting this one right and he uses just one drop per 10 ml bottle of bilberry and when you add it to this e-juice this flavor just there's something weird about it that makes you ask yourself why you like it so much like you you it's so weird but you can't stop vaping it so 
That's an interesting one. I don't know if I'm actually going to try that one, but if you're into uh, really unique e-juices, give that one a shot. So the DIY e-liquid subreddit, they do a monthly recipe thread every month. And uh, you can go back to past months and see a whole bunch of really cool recipes. So I'm going to really start keeping an eye on this, on these threads, because that's a lot of fun. And I think DIY e-juice is really something that I'm going to start getting into a lot more. Okay, well, with that said, let's get into some news. We'll start with some of the advocacy regulation, you know, laws and government type stuff. So the first one here on the list. So Utah passed a law making online purchases illegal by residents after July 1st. The law prohibits citizens of Utah from buying any vaping-related products, including e-liquid, from any business except in a face-to-face -face transaction. And because Utah has encouraged local zoning laws that make brick-and-mortar businesses nearly impossible to open in many areas, they've practically created a full ban. It's estimated that there are about 35,000 vapors in Utah, large majority of them who will no longer have access to vaping products. And a lot of these people, you know, they're using vaping to quit smoking. So. What are these people going to do? It's it's really terrible. I I can't believe they're you know they're forcing these people back to smoking. So what happened here was that this bill was promoted as a licensing bill and none of the organizations that reviewed it originally caught the fact that there was some carefully hidden language within the bill that prevented online sales in the state. This law is the work of Utah Republican Representative Paul Ray who has been fighting against the vaping industry for quite a few years now. He's even referred to the vape businesses as the scumbag industry. He consistently misrepresents Utah's vaping businesses as being affiliated with the tobacco industry. He's the guy who brought 300 school children into the Capitol for a hearing in an attempt to try to pull at the heartstrings of the legislators. And people are saying that this was a deliberate bait and switch tactic by Paul Ray. He knew that the language is in there and he chose not to disclose it. So things aren't looking good for Utah, but the Utah Smoke Free Association has retained Keller and Heckman, the law firm that's also handling the big federal lawsuit in Indiana and the lawsuit from Right to Be Smoke Free Coalition. So hopefully they can get some of that turned around there because that's just ridiculous. All right, now let's talk a little bit about the Indiana stuff going on. So if you didn't catch my last episode or if you're just not up to date on what's going on in Indiana, so there's a new law in Indiana that requires any e-juice sold within the state has to be approved by a, a, a security company and the only security company who was approved by the state was one in Lafayette, Indiana. And so that just cut out every other security company within the country, many of which who probably do qualify, but the qualifications were so specific that only this one company, uh, they were, their name is Mulhopped, qualified. Mulhopped claims that they had nothing to do with a bill, but from what I'm hearing from everybody, it sounds like they actually lobbied for this bill and had quite a lot to do with it. And honestly, it seems pretty suspicious that only one company in the whole country would qualify, and they're in Lafayette, Indiana. It's just too much of a coincidence there. But anyway, they've only approved six e-juice companies within the entire country, and two of them aren't even selling e-juice yet. They're not even manufacturing. So really four. And well, while I'm on that topic, they actually did approve one more on the deadline day. That was June 30th. And so now there's seven. And people are saying that this was Mulhop's attempt at proving that it wasn't just a, a monopoly. But yeah, no one is, I don't think anyone is really falling for that one. So anyway, now this is all passed and a lot of businesses are going out of business. Uh, employees are being fired and state senator Ron Alting this week is joining the mounting calls to reevaluate the law again in 2017 you know a year from now that's uh, not gonna do a whole lot but not for the businesses that are existing right now a lot of those businesses are gonna be gone but at least it does open it up for new businesses to come back in 2017 but anyway Senator Alting said I give you my word that I'll work with leadership in the Senate and we're going to get that thing fixed this was supposed to be about safety in an unregulated industry, not about creating monopolies. And last week, John Gregg, a Democrat candidate for governor in Indianapolis, said that reports about this apparent monopoly are more than a little disturbing and that a review of the law is in order. And Senator Alting, he said, I know how this looks. I'm not sure what to say about the backlash. That said, I don't live in a make-believe world. I'm just here to tell you that's not how this was supposed to work out. The vape legislation is not doing a very good batting average in general, and maybe that's because it's such a new product. I don't know. No matter what, we have to get this fixed quick. So, 
while it's terrible what's happening right now in Utah, it's good at least that the politicians, both Democrats and Republicans, see that there's an issue, a really big issue, and hopefully they're going to get it fixed. And then I saw on Kasa.org's Facebook page some pictures from Hoosier Vapors in Indiana showing what their shelves now look like. And you can see if you scroll through this album, you see that their shelves are practically bare. There's nothing left because they're only allowed to sell from seven different manufacturers now, um, technically five because two are not in business yet. And from what I've been hearing, that equals to about 11 flavors. So that's not a lot of choice for people. And I've seen some photos too of some vape shops open during normally busy hours and showing that the shop is practically empty. The only person in the shop is the employee. And that's because vapors are now losing interest already. There's no one wants to come into a shop that doesn't have any e-juice. That's really sad. I can only imagine how many businesses are going to go under because of this. All right, moving on. So I got an email from the Center for Tobacco Products because I, I signed up for their email list just to get updates on things that the FDA is doing as it relates to tobacco products now since electronic cigarettes are considered tobacco. But anyway, this email was titled... Tobacco product manufacturing facilities are invited to offer site visits for FDA staff. So basically what they're saying is that they're inviting vape shops, well any tobacco product manufacturing facility, but now vape shops are included. They say that exactly here in this text. You can apply to have FDA staff come visit your manufacturing facility to see how things are done in your shop. They claim that it's going to help them implement tobacco provisions on the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, but they do also state that it's not intended to include or replace official FDA inspections of facilities to determine compliance. Anyone interested can submit a request by August 15th, 2016. Now, honestly, I don't really see why any shop would want to do this. I don't know, maybe I'm missing the point here. Uh, I haven't seen anyone really talking about this, so I don't know, but, you know, FDA, these guys are not doing anything good for us, and I don't see how inviting them into your shop is going to do anything better. Personally, if it was me, at least from what I know, which is practically nothing about this, but I wouldn't invite them, mostly just because I don't trust them. All right, and then let's talk about some science and research. So there's only one subject to talk about this week, and that's that there was a study recently that shows that 6.1 million Europeans have quit smoking with the use of electronic cigarettes. I saw this posted on Dr. Farsalino's blog. I believe he had something to do with this study. Let me scroll down here and take a look. Yes, he was one of the researchers in the study. So they found that more than 9 million people have reduced smoking consumption in the use with the use of electronic cigarettes they found that out of 48.5 million Europeans who have ever tried electronic cigarettes 7.5 million of them are current users and among those current users 35.1 percent have quit smoking while an additional 32.2 percent have reduced smoking consumption Farsalinos he says that these are probably the highest rates of smoking cessation and reduction ever observed in such a large population study. And a neuroscientist and researcher at the French National Research Institute for Health and Medical Research, Jacques Lehouzek, said that in non-smokers, we observe some experimentation with electronic cigarettes, but regular use is minimal. Just 1.3% of non-smokers reported current use of nicotine-containing electronic cigarettes, and 0.09% reported daily use. Practically, there is no current or regular use of nicotine-containing e-cigarettes by non-smokers. There goes that whole gateway to smoking claim. So really good news. This one was published in the journal Addiction and was put together by the scientist from the University of Patras, Greece, Onassis Cardiac Surgery Center in Greece, and the French National Research Institute for Health and Medical Research. So some pretty big groups there. All right, now let's talk about some, just some editorials that I came across online that I thought was interesting. So this first one here is on Thrillist.com. It's titled, These Vaping Conspiracy Theories Can't Be True, Right? So this one was written by someone named Dave Infante, and he is not a vapor, so this is a look at our industry, the, the theories within our industry, conspiracy theories within our industri industry, from an outsider's look point of view. So he starts out the article talking about the FDA's new regulations, allowing it to regulate vapor products. He says, on the surface, it all makes sense. Government regulation brings with it quality standards, mainstream faith in the marketplace, and hopefully a long-term benefit to the public health. So why is the vaping industry calling foul? So the author spoke with over a dozen pro-vape advocates to find out, and nearly all of those sources claimed to be in favor of regulation, but did not agree with the FDA's approach. He says that suggestions of vast conspiracies are fringe claims mostly, and the paranoia in the pro-vape camp is pervasive, verging on obsessive. 
So let's examine them. This first one here is that big tobacco killed vaping. The alleged reason is that vaping endangered cigarette revenues and outpaced tobacco technology. So we spoke with the owner of Vapor for Life, Steve Millen, who said, it all comes down to big business. What the tobacco companies are doing is trying to eliminate all their competition. And the reason he's saying this is because basically the FDA's regulatory requirements require an insurmountable financial burden to most vapor companies. And the author mentions here that that part is probably true. No denying that. The author also points out that Big Tobacco has lots of cash and the liquidity to tie it up in calculated gambles to get their e-cigarettes onto shelves after the two-year grace period expires but most vaping companies don't. So it's easy to see that larger corporate players stand to potentially benefit from the FDA's regulations, but are they deliberately poisoning the well? Maybe. He says that the theory's central bit of evidence is the fact that in 2014, RJ Reynolds, Altria, and Lorillard all submitted comments to the FDA suggesting that the agency should ban open system mods, which are all the ones that we use now, all the ones that we love and help us stay off of cigarettes. The next one here is that big pharma killed vaping. So the reason for this is that vaping endangered nicotine replacement therapy and medical treatment revenues. So Aaron Biebert, the director of A Billion Lives, he said, you look at anti-vaping tobacco control organizations and they say who their donors are. It's all big pharmaceutical companies. And the author points out here that he's not wrong. The American Lung Association lists AstraZeneca and Pfizer as two of its major corporate partners. The American Cancer Society has Merck and Genentech. The American Heart Association has Bristol-Myers Squibb, GlaxoSmithKline, and Pfizer, and so on. So what would be their motive? Well, obviously, they want to corner the nicotine replacement therapy market. Without the boost of e-cigarettes' enormous growth, the category of NRT products are pretty lackluster. But thanks to the popularity of vapor products among smokers who have failed to quit using things like the nicotine patch and gum or prescription drugs, the enormous cessation market is totally changing. And that's scary stuff for Big Pharma, enough so that it gave at least a million dollars in campaign donations to at least seven senators who supported the FDA's 2016 decision on FDA regulations. And then Aaron Biebert, he also said, this isn't even a conspiracy, it's just money and politics undermining our democratic process, same as it ever was. All right, the next conspiracy theory here is that the tobacco control lobby killed vaping. And the reason is that organizations viewed vaping as tobacco use and therefore ideologically evil and don't want to swallow their pride. So the author here, he says, some people view this as a conspiracy not of money, but of morality and vanity. Pro vapors accuse tobacco control groups of being obsessive and prideful in a community that doesn't care about public health as much as it cares about being the good guy who eradicates tobacco and nicotine from society. This is a more sinister theory and almost impossible to prove or disprove. In this theory, the conspirators aren't bloodless corporate stooges, much worse. They're vindictive Puritans. Of all the theories, this one is so un unsubstantiated that even its proponents scoffed at their own paranoia when talking about it. But still, there's a rough parallel in American history where that sanctimony did drive prohibition of a specific vice, and that was actual prohibition. And I think that this author might have a little different outlook on this if he would have talked to someone like Professor Siegel, who is in the tobacco harm reduction community and also seems to believe that this conspiracy theory is true. All right, and the last conspiracy theory here is that bureaucracy killed vaping, the reason being that states were desperate for cigarette tax revenues and viewed vaping regulation as a way to legitimize agencies' existence. The theory behind this one is that the Tobacco Master Settlement Agreement, which was created in 1998, bound the big four tobacco companies, which were Philip Morris, R.J. Reynolds, Brown and & Williamson, and Lorillard, to pay $206 billion back to the states in Medicaid costs, smoking-related public health damages, and advocacy funding, and that was to be given to states over the next quarter century, over the next 25 years. And what happened is that banks like Citigroup, JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, they offered these state governments upfront cash for the rights to their future payouts. And for some ridiculous reason, these states took it. These deals had given states and local governments approximately $64 billion in future debt in exchange for only $3 billion in cash from the banks. So really poor financial decisions there. But anyway, now these debts are coming due and the cigarette tax revenues that the states were getting have completely fallen because people, so many people are quitting smoking. So that money had to be paid somehow, right? So legally the debt has to be repaid with settlement money, not tax money. So now governments are using vaping reg regulation as a cure to stem the decline of cigarette taxes, hopefully generating enough revenue to replace the settlement money that needs to be used to repay the bonds without say, sending states into default. So the author here closes it out with, 
Should we believe the conspiracies? He says, despite the wide-eyed, far-reaching, and in some cases, thinly supported hypothesis of global corporate federal medical collusion against vaping, each of these claims springs from actual truths, and a little bit of truth can lead to a whole lot of truthing. So I get the feeling that he's still kind of not totally sure about whether or not to believe these conspiracy theories, but after doing his research, he does seem to believe that there might be something to it. Okay, let's talk about this next one from Wired.com. This one's titled, E-cigs are going tobacco-free with synthetic nicotine. So as most of you know, e-juice is usually usually contains nicotine, which comes from tobacco. And that's one of the ways the FDA has started to try to, to work their way in is calling electronic cigarettes tobacco products. But now there's a new t nicotine on the market, it's synthetic nicotine, and it has the same molecular formula as a natural version. And some people are saying that it just might not fall under the FDA's vaping regulations. So Ron Tully started Next Generation Labs, which is just a small company that makes tobacco-free nicotine for vaping companies. They aren't the first company to make synthetic nicotine, but they do appear to be the first company to target the vaping market. And the owner, he says that synthetic nicotine tastes better in e-juice because it tastes like nothing. The stuff that's extracted from tobacco might still have a little bit of that plant flavor, which creates off flavors that liquid manufacturers usually mask with sweeteners and aggressive flavors. The downside of synthetic nicotine, though, is the cost. One of the people using Next Generation Labs synthetic nicotine is a company called SQN. They have three lines, NKTR, which I believe is pronounced nectar, and uh, nectar sour, and melt. And the owner of SQN says that Ne NGL's synthetic nicotine costs 13 times as much as the readily available nicotine. NGL says that they had a team sp who spent two years trying to figure out how to scale up the process of creating synthetic nicotine. The final synthesis involves four major steps and takes about a week, with various steps involving heating and cooling to optimize the reactions. The owner declined to detail the synthesis, citing pending three patents. So the question here is that since this is not made from tobacco, should it be considered a t tobacco product? Tully, the owner of Next Generation Labs, says that he doesn't think it should count, but obviously there's wording in the new regulations that say intent. So if it's intended to be used in an electronic cigarette, the FDA can regulate it as a tobacco product. So I don't really think this is going to do anything. Um, I think it's a cool idea just for the fact that it's supposedly really clean and has no flavor. I think that could be good for making some really nice tasting e-juice. But I don't think it's going to do anything to thwart the FDA's regulations. Okay, and then I got an email. If you're on the A Billion Lives email list, you will have probably gotten this email. They announced a North American premiere invitation. So they're finally going to premiere their documentary in North America. This will be at the historic Pabst Theater in Milwaukee. It's going to be on August 6th, 2016 at 7 p.m. Tickets go on sale on Wednesday, July 6th at noon at the Paps Theater box office or at papstheater.org. They are expecting a sellout because over 13,000 people did receive this invitation. And if you're a member of the media, a political leader, or have helped them in the past, please reach out because he has reserved some tickets specifically for those people. And there's also going to be a bar in the lobby and they're planning an epic after party celebration presented by Molecule Labs. And if you do plan to go, this is considered a formal event. I wish I could go see that. Man, I really want to see that movie. All right, so now let's get into the tips and tricks section of the show. So this first one I want to talk about is a post on ecigaretteforum.com. It's titled Vaping Tools. So this one is about the best tools that are used for vaping purposes, not necessarily designed for vaping. So the original poster, Super Tracker, Super Trekker, he got the ball rolling by talking about this coil building tool that he created. It's basically designed to make oblong coils and it's uh, three pieces of 1 16th inch stainless steel rods held side by side with a piece of tape. The reason he created this is because some RDAs have oblong air holes. So he wanted to create an oblong coil so it's kind of like a chimney so that the airflow can flow up through the coils, through an oblong coil. So pretty neat idea. Uh, if, you, if you're watching the video of this and you're seeing the picture, you'll see the RDA there that has the coils that he built on it and an ohmmeter. It was kind of confusing to me at first because I thought he somehow built all of this together, but uh, the ohmmeter has nothing to do with his tool. The tool is just those three bars there. So if you scroll down, you'll see someone mention these really sharp snippers. He doesn't actually give a name to what they are, so I have no idea, but he says he only got them for $1.27. They look really sharp. He says he has them in his road rebuild kit, so he takes them with him on a go. And then another guy, he mentions Legos. 
so he created a spool holder with several homemade bobbin threaders made out of coat hangers. I'm not exactly sure what's going on here. It looks like he's got some coat hangers, coat hanger wire that reaches to both sides of the spool. I don't know, I'm not sure how he attached the coat hangers to the spool holes, but he did it somehow. And then he has the coil wire running through some heat shrink wrap so that it doesn't unspool. And then it's on top of a little, like a Lego setup that he created. It's a pretty neat idea. He also created a battery holder for all of his batteries using Legos. And he created a battery tester. So he bought a cheap voltmeter from Fast Tech and then built it into a little Lego setup. You can do a lot with Legos. They're really cool. Too bad Legos are so expensive though. But I have seen really big bags of them at flea markets before for pretty good deals. I, I should probably keep an eye out for that. This next person, he mentions that he uses a dental pick, uh, like one of those plaque scrapers that dentists use. And he uses it to scrape the crud out of crown coils tucking wicks into RDAs and scraping their coils. That's a handy tool. I actually have one of those. This person shows a little blue screwdriver fashioned into a earring. So that's one way to keep your screwdriver with you at all times. And this one is really cool. This is a magnifying glass with like a bendable neck and it's attached to the desk with using a clip. I think that's really cool, especially for people who who might have vision problems. You know, coils are really tiny and they can be hard to see. I do have terrible vision without my contacts. I think I have something like 20-20 vision with my contacts, but still I sometimes have to squint when I'm building those little tiny coils. I think that magnifying glass and the Lego stuff are my favorite tips from this thread. All right, let's move on to, oh, so if you've never heard of a company called eJuice Mafia, they're pretty well known on Reddit as being a really terrible company. So they send people eJuices. A lot of times they're sending like the wrong bottles or they're sending flavors that have zero nicotine when they've asked for three or six or whatever. And they constantly get orders wrong. You see these threads on Reddit all the time. They also take weeks to ship sometimes. If you send an email to their customer service, they just don't respond. And some people have said that they even make toilet juice, which means hairs have been found, melted O-rings, peppery nicotine. So sounds pretty bad. They're also known for taking people's money without shipping orders. And what really got them on the radar of Reddit was that they started getting negative reviews and criticism on Reddit, and they came in and handled it really poorly. They cussed out people on Reddit. They were just being real jerks. And they even did a lot of astroturfing when they first started up on Reddit, meaning that they were sending shills to come onto Reddit pretending to be customers. So, yeah, not a good company. But anyway, all that being said, what this is about is that Ejus Mafia has rebranded themselves, probably to get away from all of this terrible publicity, and now they're named Ejus Vapor. So they're at ejusvapor.com. Oh, another thing to mention I hear a lot about is that once you get on their email list, you pretty much can't get off. They'll just keep sending you emails every day. So don't get on that email list. Watch out for those guys. All right, and then I have three more that are three more tips that are more catered towards newbies. So. Uh, this one is titled using my dripper to taste test at my local shop So this person he went to his new vape shop that opened down the road as he was testing e-juices the guy handed him a little tiny vape pen and if you've ever been to a vape shop that has vape pens You know how much that sucks because you get like zero flavor and that's what this guy experienced So the vape shop owner he saw him struggling and said if you have your dripper on you I can let you drip he didn't have his dripper on him But he went back to his car and thought about it And then he started getting anxious and nervous about going back with his dripper because he's never done it before And he's wondering how does he drip a bunch of flavors in a row and find one he likes he says do I bring cotton and rewick after a few Juices do I just leave the wick out and drip on the coils? Do I keep flooding the cotton with more and more different flavors and some pretty good tips here? This person says leave the cotton in the coil and cut the tails so you can dry the cotton in two or three rips You can just cut a strip thread it through and cut the remainder off at the coil and then it makes rewicking a 10 second process. So that's a really cool idea. I never thought of that. That's if you want to rewick every time you try a new e juice. This person says, You don't need to completely saturate the wick to taste the flavor. I bring a dripper with me and just use a few drops to taste. And that's actually how I do it. I just, I take my, whatever dripper I have with me, I vape it dry, not completely dry because I don't want to burn hit, but dry enough. And I just put, you know, three to five drops on my coil, take some three to five drags. And it gives me a pretty good idea of what the vapor is supposed to taste like, or what the e-juice is supposed to taste like. So that's how I do it. And this person mentions that some flavors will stick to your device and be more prevalent over others. So choose wisely. Obviously, you don't want to vape a coffee right when you get there because that coffee flavor is just going to stick in your wick and you're not going to get the flavors out of the rest of the e-juices after that. So keep that in mind. This person mentions that he always uses a large Clapton coil 
with no cotton because Clapton coils are pretty good at holding Aegis themselves. That's a cool idea. This person, I really like this idea the best. He says, temp control is great for this. You cut the legs off your wick, two or three drops on each coil, and vape it till there's no more vapor production, and then you drip the next flavor. And this one, one other person has a tip saying, just drip a drop onto your hand and lick it off. Saves you the trouble of building a dripper and gives you a much better idea of the flavor. All right, this next question on Reddit is asking if you should steep zero milligram e-juice. So he did some research, he's a new vapor, did some research and learned that steeping makes e-juice taste better, so he started doing it. He's a non-smoker who's been vapor for about a month and a half and always gets zero milligram juice. Does it need steeping? There's not a whole lot of comments here on this, but basically, yes, you do still need to steep it. It's not the nicotine that needs steeping, it's the flavors that need steeping. The flavors combining with the other ingredients like PG or VG and sweeteners. So obviously, you want all of that to steep together. So yes, you do need to steep zero milligram e-juice. And this last tip here is, a, is titled, A Smarter Way to Prime Coils. So this is a, a really old tip, and this person claims that a lot of people are still priming like the olden days. Uh, I don't know. This seems really old to me. I don't know if that's true or not. Maybe just where this person lives. Or maybe I'm, maybe I'm in my own little bubble. But anyway, this tip here is to do primer pulls. So what you do is you, you fill up your atomizer. You don't... Because a lot of times you drip e-liquid onto the coil before you install it, so but that gets kind of messy. So this method doesn't require that you do that. You just install the coil dry, fill up your tank, close off all the air holes, make it airtight, as airtight as you can. You can put your hands over any, any slots or anything, any holes, and then pull. And you obviously, you won't be getting any airflow because everything is closed up. But what it's doing is it's sucking the e-juice through into the coil. So this requires that you don't actually have to drip e-juice into the coil before installing it. And I just want to point out that you're not firing the device while you're doing this primer pull. But yeah, so that's it. It's a really easy tip. I remember when I first learned that, I was blown away. But it's not a new tip, but I, it's a good tip to give to people who are new to vaping. And that's actually what I do. I don't install my coils dry. I always prime them first, just drip some e-juice into the coil, and then I do some primer pulls, and then I vape. All right, and one last story here. This isn't a tip or anything. It's just something that I thought was interesting and that I, I learned from. Uh, it's a thread on Reddit titled, Depressed After I Started Vaping. So he says that depression isn't something new to him. He's been depressed his whole life. He used to smoke one pack a day, then quit smoking a month ago and switched to vaping. It was fun at first, but then his depression got worse to the point of having suicidal thoughts, but he doesn't want to go back to smoking, so what should he do? So like most people point out, this person needs to go to a, seek some help, some professional help, because it's not vaping or smoking that's causing his depression necessarily. What he really needs to do is get to the root of the problem. But there was a comment here from M. Gremlin. He says that cigarettes contain MAOIs, which are antidepressants, and he says that this is what really hooks people in and causes serious problems when you try to quit. Other research online actually shows that this is a pretty commonly known thing, I guess, within the medical community. And this is why many physicians prescribe antidepressants to people to help them quit smoking. So that's really crazy. I, d I didn't know that cigarettes contained antidepressants. And obviously, when you quit smoking, you know, that's probably one of the things that makes it so hard because you're no longer longer getting that antidepressant and then you start feeling depressed, at least to some level. Anyway, I just thought that was something useful to know. You know, if you know anyone who's getting off of cigarettes and they're struggling with depression themselves, you can let them know about this and tell them that it's really just a side effect are one of the side effects of quitting smoking and it will go away and if it if it gets worse they need to seek help and it's also something you should look look for in your friends who are quitting smoking you know if you see that they're starting to to be depressed uh, see if you can help them through that. Okay, so that's going to do it for this episode. You'll find the show notes for this show on vapepassion.com episode 23. And if you want to support the show consider donating to my Patreon page. Even just a dollar a month will help. Um, it'll add up and it'll really help me keep the show going. You can follow me on Twitter, at Vape Passion. If you watch this on YouTube, don't forget to subscribe on iTunes, Stitcher, or Google Play. I'm on all three of those. And if you want to be notified of future episodes, subscribe to my newsletter. So like always, if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to send me an email at alex at vapepassion.com, or you can just comment on one of my videos on YouTube, and I'll respond. All right, so thanks so much for stopping by, and I hope to see you again next week.